Life Doula UK. And then we'll be hearing from the Reverend Juliet Stevenson, director of the Good Funeral Company in Liverpool. And uh, I believe I was going to check with her. I believe she has been funeral celebrant of the year at some point. So she has comes with a huge amount of experience and really is a great person to have on our panel, you know, for um, wisdom in working very compassionately and, um, and uh, thoroughly with families in the funeral process. Our panelists will each speak for around uh, 10 minutes and then we'll have uh, a conversation between ourselves. I'd like to begin um, with a short video of about three minutes from the States. Uh, the, the Heart Edge Network is an international network. I was hoping to get somebody from Death Over Dinner in the States, but we're going to just start this conversation with a very short video of their work, um, deathoverdinner.org, because uh, it's worth seeing. Welcome to Death Over Dinner. You might be asking yourself, what could death and dinner possibly have in common? Or maybe you're wondering why someone would even want to talk about death, especially over an otherwise pleasant supper. Well, here's the deal. The way we die in America, and now in many other parts of the world, is pretty messed up. Not just the fact that we die. End-of-life care is far from ideal, and it causes a lot of bankruptcies. Most people die in hospitals, and they are really expensive. Yet, 75% of America says they want to die at home, and only 25% of us do. Regardless of where we spend our last weeks, days, or moments, the thing we are really missing is a straightforward conversation. It's obvious if you think about it. If you don't tell your loved ones what you want during your last mile, you won't get it. Say, for example, you wanted a vacation in Aruba, but you didn't tell anyone, and your well-meaning family booked you a long, costly ticket to Antarctica. Not what you wanted. The default when it comes to dying is also very expensive. And like Antarctica, most likely not what you wanted. Not telling your loved ones what you want only makes everything a lot harder for everyone, emotionally and logistically. They're already going to be devastated by losing you. On top of that, imagine having to make a seemingly endless list of decisions and to make them immediately during your grief. So we came up with a simple solution, dinner in conversation, just talking to each other, openly, directly, authentically. Since we launched, there have been over 100,000 dinners in 30 countries. It seems these two things go together quite nicely. So, what happens at a death dinner? It all begins with our website. You tell us why you're interested in having a dinner, and when you select an intention, we magically create a script for your evening. In this script, you will find a series of thoughtful questions for everyone who comes to dinner to consider an answer. If you don't like a particular question, don't answer it. And that's about it. But here are a few pointers. Don't surprise people. Pizza night. Surprise. Death dinner. No. Don't hog the talking stick. Put that phone away. No one needs you to be checking your Instagram while they are talking about how they want to be remembered. Make something simple. Light some candles. Create the right ambiance. Give yourself plenty of time. Make I statements. This is not an opportunity to argue. There are no experts in death. Listen deeply. Say something you're afraid to say. It is the quickest way to get closer to the people in your life. When you're done, maybe you want to take some next steps and put a few things in writing. Our goal is to change the way we die, one conversation at a time. Join us. Changing the way we die, one conversation at a time. I find that really powerful. Um, I know for some of us, uh, sitting around a meal with friends in in our homes seems like a distant memory. If you're if you're in a especially in a part of the UK that you can't do that at the moment, but this is uh, this is an idea for perhaps uh, when when um, when when that is possible. So I'm going to hand over now to Leah, who, who's going to kick off our conversation. Thank you, Leah. Thanks, Kath. 
Um, being American, I really appreciated the straightforwardness of that video. I'll be talking today about death cafes, which uh, they share some similarities, but are actually quite different from death over dinner. Uh, a bit of background. Three years ago, I gave birth to my first child. Rowan was born in terrible, dangerous circumstances before we could get to the nearest hospital. I was attending a conference on the other side of London when I went into labor unexpectedly and um, just couldn't get medical care in time. Worst experience of my life. Despite everything, he was born alive and he lived for 39 minutes. In a lot of ways, I was actually really fortunate these were the days before the pandemic, remember those? Hospitals were very different places. Um, so my, my husband, Jonathan, and I were able to spend the night at the hospital. We were taken to a special room in the maternity ward um, that is uh, set aside for bereaved families. Rowan's body lay next to us all night in a special refrigerated cot. And I was really conscious that that night was all the time that we would have together as a family. A few weeks later, uh, following an exhaustive and exhausting search across London for a burial site that we both liked and could afford, uh, we buried him at Brompton Cemetery. And one day, uh, and hopefully this will be later rather than sooner, Jonathan and I will both be cremated and will be buried with Rowan in a single grave. After Rowan's death, as you might imagine, some truly terrible days followed. Uh, although the, the death of an infant is a particular type of tragedy and it has its own specific set of pitfalls, the death of any life is, is a heartbreak. And as many of you will know, grief can be a bleak and an extremely lonely journey. Um, I was also discovering that the journey of grief can be full of curiosity. I found that uh, there was a lot that I wanted to talk about with other people. I wanted to talk about the physicality of Rowan's death the way that his body changed um, in color and in temperature as that night progressed. I really wanted to talk about the experience of holding him during those hours and what that felt like. Um, I wanted to talk about the sheer avalanche of bureaucracy that death involves. No one ever really tells you about that, that ahead of time. I wanted to talk about the choices that we had made about where to bury him and how we plan to do it. And above all, I uh, really wanted to talk about what it means to live with death day in and day out, and what that means for the way that you approach your own death and therefore how you want to live the rest of your life. Unfortunately, I discovered that many people um, find that death is the very last thing they want to talk about. I discovered that the cliche of people crossing the street to avoid you, both physically and metaphorically, is a cliche for a reason. Uh, eventually, I got fed up and I decided to find a place where I could have these conversations, where they could be held in a safe and supportive way. So shortly after Rowan's first anniversary, I began the Death Cafe program at Brompton Cemetery um, as an outreach activity of the cemetery. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Death Cafe is an international movement. It actually started here in London. Its aim is very simply to get people together to discuss death to increase awareness so that people can make the most of the rest of their lives. And according to the uh, official statistics on the website, to date over 11 and a half thousand death cafes have been held in 73 countries. But um, I, I know that the real number of conversations is actually far higher. Pre-pandemic, I ran regular death cafes at the cemetery's visitor information center. Um, and I would do these for up to 15 people at a time, always with tea and coffee and biscuits. That also seems like a, a very distant memory. In my professional life, I, I work as a mediator. So um, I have a lot of experience of group facilitation and it seemed like a really good use of my skills. People come to death cafes with all sorts of things they want to discuss. And I, I think this is where it, it differs crucially from death over dinner. So there's no agenda, there's no script. Um, you simply go around the table, you introduce yourself you say a little bit about what brings you to the conversation that day and then off you go. The conversation just unfolds from there. Um, in March, when the pandemic began, I had to shift the program online very quickly. And around the same time, my vicar, Lucy Winkett at St. James's Piccadilly asked me to convene death cafes for the, the uh, dis now dispersed community of the church. And um, that's where I've worshiped for many years. So I now run death cafes entirely on, online using Zoom. Um, I do this for smaller numbers of people per group than I used to. 
I would say that shifting to a virtual format was a very, uh, very steep learning curve, but I've also discovered that there was a lot to gain from it. Um, so looking at this from a church perspective, for St. James's Piccadilly, I would say that the death cafes have been a really wonderful way to build community, especially at a time when it's difficult to gather in person. I've been really struck by the international reach of the church, which I hadn't realized previously. Um, every week, the, the dates for upcoming events are, uh, are announced in the weekly newsletter. And sometimes people contact me from quite far flung places uh, to say that they'd like to take part in an event. And it's always a real joy to have um, quite an international uh, group of participants. The death cafes provide a space to reflect theologically, whether we want to call it that or not, on the presence of God in this journey that is toward and through death. Um, and for me, it's been really moving and very much a privilege to facilitate these discussions on behalf of the church. Uh, do please ask me later if you're interested in the practicalities of running death cafes, particularly online. But um, before I wrap up, I, I just want to spend a few minutes responding to the bigger question of today's session, which is what can churches do to help us talk about death? After Rowan died, the single most helpful thing that I encountered was to feel that all parts of my experience, and by that I mean the loss, the grief, the fog, the rage, the fierce love, that these were not something to be brushed away, but were actually a blessing to the people around me. And I found that church was and is one of the few places where my grief felt genuinely welcome. It continues to be one of the few places where I sense that Rowan is remembered and honored and held. Um, and held within community even today. This is not to say that it's been easy, easy sailing. I, um, I confess that I struggled enormously when a few months after Rowan's death, another baby was born to a mother who very much needed the congregation to be involved with raising her child. Um, but in different ways, uh, the community sought to hold both of these children, both the living and the dead. Um, and that sheer effort made all the difference to me. That experience of how church welcomed my grief uh, really shaped and reshaped my approach to running death cafes. So officially, organizers are supposed to agree that in our publicity for, the, for death cafe events, we will state very clearly that this is not bereavement counseling. For a long time, I have felt very uneasy about the message that this sends to people. And since the pandemic, I have uh, quietly dropped that disclaimer both for the public death cafes that I run through Brompton Cemetery, and certainly for the ones that I run through St. James's Piccadilly as well. So um, we'll, we'll see if I get in trouble, but for the time being, that's just uh, the way that I feel very strongly we need to operate. Um, I think I'm, I'm nearing the end of my time. So I'll just close by saying that I think it's impossible to talk about death without talking about grief and loss at whatever level and in whatever capacity. These are all tied up in the conversations that we need to be having about death. And I'm really glad that uh, this panel is a starting point for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. Uh, so much uh, for us to think about there and reflect upon. And already questions are coming in, which we will come to after the um, three panelists, but uh, do put your, your questions and your comments uh, in the chat. Over to you now, Lee. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks, Kath. As Kath said, I'm an end of life doula um, or a death doula, as we're sometimes known. For those of you who haven't heard this term before, I sometimes find the term myself a little bit off putting. It's not one that I would have chosen for myself, um, partly because it has slightly new agey overtones, um, but also because most people don't know what that term means. If instead I was to say to you, I'm an end of life companion, that would probably give you more of a sort of handle immediately if you didn't already know what we do. Or my particular favorite term actually is amicus mortis, a friend in death. And if that wasn't quite so Harry Potter, Potterish, I think that's what I'd probably use. Um, our job really is to fill in the gaps that some of the health services and social services can't always provide because of the restraints they're under. And it's not a new role. There would always be a woman in the community years ago who'd go in and help um, to attend to the dying. But as death has become more medicalized and hidden behind closed doors, um, people are really not used to having the dead in their midst. 
and uh, sometimes very uncomfortable about how to handle that. Our job then is really to sort of help people um, become as comfortable as they can in their dying moments and also just to live life as fully as they can right up until the last breath. So it's not all about death, a lot of it is about living well as well. And how that looks is that we provide practical and emotional support for people who are dying and their friends and families. Some of that's very practical and it might involve helping with household chores, preparing meals for people. Um, we might sometimes organize rotors between family members and friends and family and members of the community, making sure that people don't have 5,000 casseroles clogging up their freezers, but nobody to take their kids to ballet lessons or something. So um, it's really listening to what a family wants and not making assumptions. We are there to signpost people to other services. That might include directing them towards clergy if that's felt to be um, something that would benefit them. And we're there as advocates really to make sure that their wishes are upheld. That might actually include taking them to appointments um, sometimes it's really difficult when people are faced with lots of information that's um, flowing their way to take that in, particularly if it's bad news. And it's sometimes useful to have somebody who's just maybe one step removed to talk through information with them afterwards and make sure that they're being listened to if they don't feel that they've got a voice at that particular time. Other practical steps might involve um, sorting out people's belongings and tying up loose ends that might be possibly writing letters to estranged family members and just helping people to sort of make peace with the last part of their life. Another part of the job that sometimes involves more of the living is to write advanced plans with people and help them think about what they want to go into those. That will be looking at setting up lasting power of attorney for people, making sure that their wills are in order, maybe discussing advanced decisions to refuse treatment, which is becoming more and more important as the medical um, side of dying tends to aim towards keeping people going for as long as possible, even when quality of life is not necessarily um, suggesting that's the best thing to do. And also writing advanced statements, which is, um, as some of you may well know, is a sort of more general view of how you would like to be treated um, as you're dying. Do you prefer to have the light on at night, for example, or would you like to have baths while you're still able to? Are there any particular family members that you don't want to come and visit you? I know mine has had to be kept very secret because I've got one sister who decided to put jelly babies all around my mother's deathbed to um, represent different members of the family. And I know I definitely don't want that happening for me. So, um, then towards the end of life, we might sit vigil with the person that's dying and help the family if that person wants to die at home. And beyond that, possibly laying people out as people used to do in the community, supporting the family in the time after death if that's something that they'd like to happen. Sometimes the doula relationship continues for a while after the death. Helping with funeral plans, and more and more doulas are getting involved in the movement towards DIY funerals, particularly where I live in Brighton, they're becoming quite popular, where people are tending to bring the, the dead, their dead back to the community and keep them at home for a while and sort out um, alternative forms of um, burial and things. But the most important job really is listening and having difficult conversations about life, both with the dying person themselves and their families, but also talking about their life. As we go towards the end of life, a lot of people need to make sense of all the experiences that they've been through. Um, and just sort of having somebody as a sounding board really can uh, lessen the anguish as, as people head towards death. It's not quite what I thought the job was going to be. A lot of it is a bit more roll your sleeves up and do uh, practical things like walking people's dogs. Actually, I say that I'm never going to do that because I won't pick up other people's dog poo. That's just not going to happen. But it's not as I thought it was going to be, which I thought I'd be out every other night sitting on the edge of people's beds and holding their hands and mopping their brows. Maybe a slightly romanticised view 
Um, there's a lot more to it than that. The training and diploma that I did with a foundation called Living Well, Dying Well did focus a little bit on care of the body after death, but the vast majority of the training was really about self-reflection and just making sense of our own relationship with death and really staring our own mortality in the face. Um, the analogy I suppose I would use is a bit like the advice you're given on an aircraft about making sure that you've got your own oxygen mask fitted before you can hope to help anybody else. And that's a continual process. We're always learning things from the dead through this work as well, through the, um, from the dying. Some of the relationships that we form with people are very short. Um, I've had one client I was called in by a drug and alcohol counsellor to work with a, um, a homeless person who was dying in a hostel and I only spent a few short hours with him. Luckily we formed a very quick bond over a shared love of punk and that meant we were able to sort of talk about really important things very quickly. Um, he'd never really been listened to about the fact that he was dying. In fact nobody had told him he was dying but he had that knowledge himself. And we used the very short time that I saw him to make plans. He was surprised to find out I could book gig tickets for him to go to a last gig. He talked about his estranged family and we talked about writing letters to them um, to explain how he felt. Um, he was very fond of poetry and I looked at putting some of his po poetry online for his friends to read after his death. And the most important thing for him was to have a great big party um, to see all of his, say goodbye to all of his friends. We didn't actually do any of those things because in the hours after I spoke to him, he kind of let go. And I think just the fact that he had been heard was enough to let him relax into the dying process. And he actually chose to send everybody away and um, chose to die in his hostel room on his own. Now we might have judgments about that ourselves and think that's terribly tragic and it wouldn't be what I would want to do. But actually in some ways, just talking about dying and his feelings and his hopes for how that would be was enough for him to take control. And that might've been one of the only times in his life which he'd spent on the streets um, where he was in control of what was happening to him. So for him, that was, a, that was a good result. I've also had clients who last a lot longer than they anticipate. So I've been working with one elderly person for the last two and a half years, who's very frustrated at still being alive. Um, she's really ready to let go, but her body just won't give up. And more of the time now that I spend with her is trying to deal with those frustrations and trying to get her to find some little pockets of joy in the things that she can still do so that she's trying to make more of her life um, in the last few months or, or possibly years that she's got. What I've learned doing this job really is that I, I believe so firmly that we all have a duty to try and encourage people to talk more openly about death and dying and things like the Death Cafe movement and um, the death over dinner are so important for doing that. I think um, the clergy are in a particularly good position to be able to open that conversation up to people. Um, and I think as Leah said, I think the idea of having death cafes in churches would be a fantastic one. Um, Juliet, who's going to be talking in a little while, suggested when we were having a, a planning meeting, how about having a doula in every church? And that's something I'd actually not thought about. I've been so, we've all been so busy banging on hospital doors saying, let us in. Um, but a, a church um, doula could work really well. We're not a religious organization. We work with people of all faiths and none. Um, but I don't think there's any reason that that would, that that would be a problem. I think the, the other thing is really to try and use um, things that dying people have said is that they wish that people would use proper language around death and that we could get rid of all the euphemisms about passing or um, any of the other the, any of the other terms that are used we all die and we need to use that term it's not something to be ashamed of um, so that's one thing I'd encourage people to use and just really to help bring death back into the community and empower people to make choices 
And the more we talk about it and the more normalized death becomes, um, the easier it is to make those choices and to make them in advance because I think a lot of us leave things too late. And um, I would encourage everybody to do some advanced planning. If there's one way you can open up talking to other people about death and dying is to actually look at your own plans for your own death and in, in an ideal what you would do um, what you would do with that and the other thing really is just to see the dying as individuals who've got experiences and lives and not as a set of symptoms or a problem to be solved um, right up until the last minute they are living I will hand back over to Kath at that point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. That was uh, extraordinarily rich and um, uh, very, very helpful indeed. Juliet, over to you. Um, hi, everyone. I can see looking around um, the Brady Bunch kind of screen, there's a few dog collars amongst you. So I'm just going to presume you are clerics. Um, many of you might be in disguise. Um, currently in tier three in Liverpool, um, we are filming Batman the movie. So there's a lot of superheroes um, on the streets at the moment. And I guess each and every one of you in your own way are being superheroes in your own lockdown. Um, my name's Juliette Stevenson. I'm, I'm the vicar version, not the actress version. And my, um, I've been ordained for 16 years. I've come from um, Newcastle, worked in a small market town, then in some rural communities, then in a suburb of a busy city. And now I'm in Liverpool. So I have experienced ministry and death ministry in lots of different contexts, from being um, the last person to find out that someone dies to the first person that finds out if someone's got a bad cold um, and to sit and to journey and to be all of the things that old fashioned vicars used to do. A lot of the stuff that Lee has talked about, about that um, being present with people um, and it still happens in some places, but not as, as much as it, as it ha ever has done. So that's a bit about me. Um, I've always been interested in funeral ministry and how we can um, serve families better and be alongside them and help them with ritual and moving forward and reflecting and accepting and just so the experience of death and bereavement can be better. So I've worked nationally with the Church of England, um, helping with seminars and looking at um, liturgies and websites and all of the kind of paraphernalia that goes around it. Um, the background to how the Church of England decided to look more closely at it was um, it came from the Weddings Project and we've all heard of the Hatch Match and Dispatch kind of scenario and so um, weddings were taken hold of, looked at, shook up and the church decided to look at funerals and also um, christenings and because other service providers are operating within that part of the industry I think the church had always seen themselves as a default setting and then they needed to realize that actually within the funeral industry there are other options and and families who are bereaved are, are looking to have more personal services so how can a church um, evolve to serve better their communities so lots of things were kind of um, looked at within those um, within that group within the life events team and within individual dioceses um, there's no doubt about it, it's extremely sad statistics for the Church of England that in the last five years um, there's been a 21% decline in church attended funerals, so in a church building, and there's been a 40% decline in crematoria services um, led by Church of England ministers, so that's lay ministers, readers and clerics and so on. And so it's not just about those sorts of numbers, although they're shocking, but it's about the pastoral connections and opportunities that clerics, ministers have in their own communities that are being missed out on. And so are we um, defaulting on our cure of souls? Do we need to up our game? Do we need to work harder to um, work with the funeral industry to enable us to have a lot of, a lot of input with people when they're going through a difficult time? So in 2018, 
Um, statistics, if you like statistics, here you go. If you hate it, just put your fingers in your ears. In 2018, the Church of England in, in England um, had 400,000 conversations with people who had lost a loved one. That assumes that within every pastoral conversation, there are three people involved. So the minister, the, the close kind of most bereaved person, and maybe two other people. So three people in a close space, in a home, are being listened to, they're having the, um, the story of the loved one talked about. So 400,000 people had a, a chance, an opportunity to have someone in their home to listen to them and to have the focus of that person right at the center. From those conversations went on to funerals that might have been in churches, could have been at crematorium or woodside or graveside burials. But from that 400,000, six and a half million people in 2018 attended a church led funeral. That is a huge amount of people. We collect statistics in the church to make us feel better. And um, some statistics that I'm gonna tell you will make you feel a lot worse. But the church only counts people who come to church for Christmas and for baptisms and for Easter. It never counts the people who come for funeral ministry. And I think that's really sad because the connections we can make and the hope that we can give to those people are vast. Six and a half million people have been in a space that has been sacred and holy and focusing on the life of somebody and then they hear a story of hope and resurrection and that's amazing. So Liverpool Diocese have been working as every other diocese with the clergy to see how things are going and they really decided to focus on funerals. How can a diocese put some energy into working more directly with the funeral industry to get some more um, business our way. And that sounds horrendous, but if we're losing families and we're losing to other um, opportunities, then why are we missing out? Why are people not coming to us? So Liverpool Diocese defined, decided to find a nerd who likes funerals and death. And um, Yes, I did. I did win. Um, I've got my, my award here. It's a coffin and inside there's a statue of Anubis. Clearly not very Christian at all, but hey. Um, so I was that person who came um, and it's called the Good Funeral Company. Now I didn't choose that name at all, but one of my favourite, favourite books about funerals and death is called The Undertaking by a funeral director from the States called... Um, Thomas Lynch, and he's a poet also. And this quote, when I read his book years ago, stood out to me. A good funeral gets the dead where they need to go and the living where they need to be. Now, I just love that. It's a, a funeral has a function. Someone has died, they're in a box, they have to go somewhere. That's a fact, but the people who are there need to be moved into a space where they can be, where they can adapt, where they can absorb, acknowledge, reflect, and all of those things that we try to do as, as ministers, as, as people who help. So a good funeral company, what we do in the Diocese of Liverpool is we work with the parishes that we've got. We support parishes that are struggling because the capacity to do the work they're presented with is too much. And they overwhelmed and it's just too difficult for them so we kind of help them support them and um, come alongside work in their churches um, but, but our main main focus is to use the opportunity with the funeral director to try to en enable a conversation to flow more easily so the default setting shifts from a question that might be um sorry your mother's died was she religious? What people hear is, I'm sorry your mother's died. Did she go to church every week? And so the question will get an answer relating to what people hear. So very often the question, was your mum religious? Doesn't actually ask the question about what kind of funeral would you like for your mum? So I'm working with the National Association of Funeral Directors with their tutors who train the new funeral arrangers to start thinking about questioning 
families? How do you interview? What kind of questions will help you serve that family better? And it might be that they say, yes, she used to go to church, but none of us do. It's not our thing. And they reject a traditional church funeral. And so they go down the, the route of, we'll do it ourselves. We'll have a secular person to lead that service. And that's perfectly fine. Everyone has a choice. Or they might go down the route of the Good Funeral Company, which would be an option of saying, we don't want a traditional church funeral. That's not the thing that would help your family and um, celebrate. But we do want our mum to have some kind of blessing from the church. We don't belong to a parish, but we like the sound of someone who comes from the cathedral team to enable us to celebrate life and to give a blessing. And so we're not trying to take funerals and bereavement work and pastoral care from parishes. We're supporting parishes and we're actually trying to be a gap filler for the funeral industry to be able to say there is another option. You don't want a Roman Catholic Requiem Mass, none of you go to church anymore, but you want a prayer and you want a Catholic prayer for your grandma, for your mum. And have you thought about having someone from this organisation? So that's the kind of thing that we're exploring. We're still very new. Obviously, we're in lockdown. So funerals have been very different. And when we had our conversation with Leah and um, Lee and Catherine um, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about what lockdown means um, for death cafe, for death doulas and for funerals in churches. And we need to adapt and we need to be more creative. So the things that we could do that we can no longer do um, are a great frustration to myself and to my clergy colleagues. Um, but offering blessings, offering prayers, offering hope, offering um, cards and anything that just will be a supportive um, thing for that family is good. And offering, offering a space for memorial. Now I'm very lucky because I'm associated with Liverpool Cathedral and Liverpool Cathedral is a building that has been built in the lifetime and the life memory of many people who still live in that city. And so um, the strap line of our cathedral is built for the people, for the people, to the glory of God. And so even if people don't have a connection with the parish church, they all have a connection with the cathedral. And so to come into the cathedral space, to light a candle, to sit quietly and pray with myself or another member of the clergy or one of our team really, really works. And to be invited to a memorial service at the cathedral to hear their loved one's name read out, again, is, is a gift for me. So I guess um, that I could go on forever and ever and ever. And I'm sure there's lots of questions. And um, the Good Funeral Company is only in Liverpool Diocese. It's part of the Diocesan Board of Finance. So what that means is I'm not employed by the church commissioners. I'm a DBF employee. And the, the, the income and the fee that I generate and goes into our diocesan budget and funds to help pay for our central staff. So we've already seen a bit of a, um, a stop in the decline. Um, we've already seen an increase in funeral fees, but it's more about engaging with people and helping them to be part of something bigger that will enable them to move on and get them where they need to be and the dead person where they need to go. That makes sense. I'm going to stop because I could talk forever. Juliet, thank you so much. Wouldn't it be a wonderful vision if every diocese in the country had had a good funeral company? It sounds like you're doing tremendous work, um, exemplary work up in Liverpool, um, much for us to learn from. And uh, Leah, and, and Leah and Lee, thank you for your inputs now. Um, I'm aware it's now quarter past five, so we have we have half an hour for uh, addressing some of the, the chat and the conversation that has already begun. Um, but was there anything as an immediate response to what you each three have heard from the others that you would like to comment on? Um, just immediate thoughts, Leah, Lee and Juliet, from what you've heard thus far before we turn to the comments. I, I think that the death doula um, <clears throat> role is 
it is so important. I'm really pleased that um, Lee's been able to unpack what it actually means because I think many people hear it and are very flippant about it and think that it doesn't concern them. It's it's a it's a Brighton thing. It's New Age. It's not for it's not for the likes of us up north. Um, but in actual fact, it's kind of it it it's. It serves a great purpose, especially I, the death doulas that I, I know um, talk about families that are, are just kind of have moved around the UK. So it's not always the case that, you know, sisters, brothers, aunties, uncles live streets away from each other and can provide that kind of round the clock, sitting, waiting, nursing, journeying, hand holding. And so it really, really does fill a huge, um, important role. So I'm, I'm delighted that Lee's been able to unpack that for us, that we can know more about it in our communities and to find out perhaps in your, where you live, if you have um, a death doula who's working and maybe invite them to some kind of event or to speak in your local parish or community, it would be good. We are all over the country. Um, end, uh, end of Life Doula UK keep a register of everybody who's done the training and the diploma and um, can match people up in different areas. That will be sort of a geographical match, but also about personalities, because that's so important as well. Um, some of the death doulas are a bit new agey and wacky, which is great if you want, if you're a new agey wacky type of person, that would suit you ideally. But other people, um, I would include myself in that, are a little bit more pragmatic and down to earth. Um, and a bit irreverent and that can work for particular sorts of people as well so there is a sort of matching process that that comes up. I was struck listening to um, to both Lee and Juliet speak that really there's a, a strong theme across all of our um, perspectives about the need for conversation yeah um, and not just conversation but I think also a need for companionship which has to happen within the context of conversation so I think the more discussions and conversations we can get people having, and I think the church has a really important role to play in facilitating those, um, I, I think the better it is for society. I know I've been taking um, in Death Matters, Dying Matters Week, which is the national, you, might, you may have all heard of it. Um, and I went to a hospice UK meeting about Dying Matters um, two years ago, and was quite sad to hear, this was in Ma the Manchester area, that churches, it's not a thing that churches seem to get involved with. Um, and it's, it's such a great opportunity to invite your um, people in your community who work with the dying and the bereaved into your space. We've got a resource in our community. We can make tea, we can bake cakes, we can do death cafe, we can do grave talk, we can have doulas in, we can have funeral doctors in um, to talk about pre-death wishes and and for people to just ask the stupid questions that aren't stupid so to really really find out about what their options are and their choices um so dying matters week um if you're in charge of a parish where you've got an influence i would really r sign up to it get involved with it and and work collegiately with the other people in your area it's a brilliant brilliant thing one of the resources that um, people who aren't trained to sort of deal with death and dying have found really useful actually comes from the Church of England. I expect a lot of you might have come across a little pack of cards called Grave Talk, um, which are just sort of conversation starters really. Some of them are about life. Oh, there we go. <laughs> some of them are about life, some of them are about death, some of them are, some are about after death. And they've been really helpful for a lot of people. Absolutely brilliant. In the chat, I've put in the chat uh, a PDF um, right at the top of the chat. There's all, all of these links to some of these things that have been mentioned um, are, in, are in that document. So do do download that and, um, and, and, and have a browse at your own leisure. Leah, did I interrupt you before? Oh, you I, I was just going to say, um, I find particularly working with the public um, through the public death cafes, where people more often than not, in fact, very rarely have any connection to a Christian church or, or a Christian faith, there's a lot of fear. Uh, there's a lot of fear about just the intricacies of death because there's so little information available. Um, so again, I, I think it, it is about increasing um, awareness. It's about increasing discussion and dialogue uh, and, and getting people to talk about what they want 
ahead of time is a great way, but I think just in general, um, finding a way to disseminate information, I think would help to um, dispel a lot of those fears. That's brilliant. Let's turn now. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. I'll thank you again in a moment. But let's turn now to some of the questions. I want to ask um, immediately as Leah was talking initially, Kate Ellis asked, had a question about your death cafe. Um, uh, how long the sessions are. Kate, would you like to ask anything more? Do unmute yourself and ask your question if, if you would like to. Okay, the question I think was how long are the sessions mm -hmm. of your death cafe sessions and what would you say is your optimum number for an online group? What have you learned there? Sure. Um, previously, when I was able to hold death cafes in person, I would run them for 90 minutes, um, bearing in mind that that involved tea, coffee, settling in, someone always being late because of the tube. Um, one of the brilliant things about Zoom is that no one can blame the tube for making them late. So um, I've, I've really found that 60 minutes is a great amount of time for a death cafe. What it does is, is that that quite um, short time means that people finish and they want to continue talking. And, and I think that's, that's a good thing. So 60 minutes for a conversation. Um, I, I'm quite boundaried about um, respecting that time. Uh, through trial and error, I have learned that seven, maximum eight people it, on, is, on an online cafe, including myself as the facilitator, really is the maximum number of participants that, um, that I, I would feel comfortable facilitating. Um, but, you know, really anywhere from three up to that number, I, I've never had a bad death cafe. There's always been a, an incredibly rich conversation that emerges, no matter how few the, the, the people who turn up. And Judith is asking where to receive resources about how to run one in her community. Um, th there is there are resources on the Death Cafe website, and actually I'll, I'll pop this into the chat if Andy hasn't already. Um, I, I would say that if you want to do something specific to churches, um, I would say follow my example and, and adapt a bit. The Death Cafe website has not quite caught up to the pandemic, so um, I think their current resources are very much focused on in-person events. Um, but, but again, trial and error, uh, these, are just the, the, these are just the circumstances we're working with where everything is online. And again, for me, it's, it's been a real blessing to be able to do it. I think um, it increases participation because people who struggle to get to um, a physical event suddenly find that they're able to join online provided they have a wireless connection. That's excellent. Lovely. And Diane is also uh, interested. Um, lots of interest in the Death Cafe. So thank you, Leah. And um, Okay, can I just say, um, I think there was another question about wanting to wanting to try one, and I want to say yes, yes, you're very welcome. I, uh, between the public series and the series that I run for St. James's Piccadilly, I tend to run maybe two or three per month, um, and uh, I think what I'll do is I'll just drop my email into the chat space, send me a message if you're interested, and I'll send you some upcoming dates. You'd be welcome to attend um, either series, and I'm, I'm very open for conversations afterwards if you have questions. That's great. Thank you. And, and the lead, I presumably find um, doulas with specific skills like British Sign Language. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we come from all walks of life in my real life, other real life. Um, I'm a musician, or at least I was before the pandemic um, and uh, until the chancellor decided I didn't have a proper job. Um, but yeah, we use all our skills. And, and again, this is where the matching service comes in handy if you need to find somebody with specific skills I would say go to end of life doula UK um, I, I tend to use music a lot in my work because that just comes up naturally excellent and thank you thank you Lee and Leah you mentioned about uh, the cost of Brompton Cemetery you're looking for somewhere that you could afford to pay for and it's you know funeral poverty is so huge isn't it it's such an unspoken um well, shame. Uh, it, it's, it's it's horrifying that the average funeral is uh, Juliet would know, but over about eight and a half thousand um, pounds. Come to live in Liverpool. Die in Liverpool. Cheaper. Right. Because not it, in London. We, we were quoted seven and a half thousand pounds for an infant grave at a very badly maintained cemetery. That's we'll not the it, one we went for. Or do it yourself and get I, rid of I, loads of the stuff. Yeah. And I know that Green Acres, which are a woodland burial um, site, they have sites up and down the country. Um, they have, um, they will do infant graves. If you want to keep it for other people to go in, 
it's a chargeable, but if you want just an infant grave, it's completely free. And part, talking about funeral poverty, one of the, the things like the good funeral company when we set it up, it was about being good in the, in the practical sense of being professional and reliable and, um, and have good feedback and great kind of um, training and support. It was also about being good in the Christian sense that um, we, we want to do good in our community and we want to give back. So we, 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 we planned into our um, financial kind of system, a way of plowing back into um, a, a funeral kind of social fund, 10% of our income every year. So we can, we, we can have that choice, opportunity, blessing of waiving and reducing cost. So even with um, bereavement payments that come out from um, local government, it still sometimes isn't, isn't adequate enough money. Um, and so we have helped on several occasions, funeral directors know that if they, if a family really, really want to have a minister there and every local authority, um, when they do a, a social fund funeral, which are sometimes called paupers funerals, will have um, an absolute minimum of what is required. And some local authorities say, you do need a minister, a celebrant to be there. And some will say, no, you don't. So that, that cost, is never factored in. So quite often we end up doing those and waiving the fee. Um, and I've got a team of people who do those. So the Archdeacon will do them, the bishops will do public health funerals. And we always take with us a congregation um, for if anyone's died alone, has no funds, no family, um, we always take with us a congregation from the cathedral to sit and to pray and to remember. And as part of our memorial services, um, when we read the names out, we, we, we indicate to the families who are there to remember their loved ones, the next 27 names that we read out are people who have died with nobody um, and have, and you are here to hear their name read out because they meant something and, and we're holding them in this space. And that actually does move people um, to think that they've been part of enabling and, 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 and giving back something. So funeral poverty is, is hard and it's awful. Um, and there are, there are lots and lots of challenges and there are lots of people who are working hard to try and change the system. Yeah. Well, that's a good testimony though. It sounds exactly where the church should be doing those um, for sharing nice. memorials. And Alison very um, wisely points out that, you know, there is some, oh, dare I say it, poor practice uh, around with clergy saying they will only take funerals from their own congregation, for example, um, which means that funeral directors stopped approaching uh, the church. Juliet, would you comment on that? Because you've seen very poor practice, haven't you? And very, very good practice. Yeah. Uh, how can we, if you've got a vicar who isn't doing the right thing, you know, how do we, if you're a member of a congregation, what do we do with that? Just give us some wisdom. If um, the gentleman's agreement has always been between the funeral profession and parishes that if someone dies and they lived in St. James Parish, they get the vicar of St. James to take that funeral. That, that was the gentleman's agreement. But I know from experience, and you all will know from experience, that if the vicar of St. James is rubbish and always is picks the kids up from school, so can't do any work after half past two, um, always has Friday as the day off, will never change it, um, always takes the half-term holidays, all of that kind of stuff that makes, brings them out of the picture, then what the funeral director will do is they won't ring the Vicar of St. James, but they also won't ring a neighbouring priest because they don't want to offend and, and break, break, break the, the agreement that you should ask that person. So what they tend to do is say to a family, well, we know that Reverend um, Pettigrew is super busy. Um, if you just want a little blessing or something, why don't I just send you the celebrant? And quite often, if families don't have a connection, they'll just say, yeah, that's fine. Um, and, and, it, and I know that, that that's an active thing that happens. Um, I would suggest that if you are in a deanery and you have clergy who you know don't like doing funerals, it's not their scale or their speciality, um, then just ask, ask them, ask your area dean for some kind of funeral champion within your area 
who has a heart for that sort of ministry and who will be a, available um, so you, you so so the film directors know that they can ring anyone in that deanery um, in the deanery that I work in as an SSM because I've got nothing to do with my free time um, we have a, ca a little catalogue that all of our film directors have and in our catalogue it has a photograph of each of us a photograph of our building how many steps to get into it what's our sound system like do we have a toilet what is the parking facility what our day off is what the fees are if i'm not available you can have such and such and so families will be able to choose a building that suits their their needs better um, and we we just work across our dean we like that and by doing that we capture as many funerals that come in as possible so it You've got to have a good deanery to do that, but it's worth pursuing. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Was, a, was it that you had a book at the back of your church saying almost, what, 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 tell us about yeah. that, Julia. Yeah, um, when, I was, we to a close. when I was an ordinand, like when Pussy was a kitten, I was on placement with a, an amazing priest in a, in a inner city church. And she had at the back of her um, church an old telephone directory you know the one with the, the, the letters down the side so you can flick it open and write your name in um, and I stole this idea and it was called the not yet dead book and so we have it in the back of my church and then you would go down the, the tabs at the side put S Stevenson Juliet Stevenson um, I do not want jelly babies anywhere near me when I die I don't want to abide with me please please I do not want I watch the sunrise it's my worst hymn I want three Christmas carols and everyone to wear a Santa hat and then it will be closed and the date now and everyone was encouraged to put things in and to update it and to change it and we had a, a lady who'd gone into a, um, a nursing home this is when I was on placement as an ordinant she died her family came to see the vicar I went to do the visit with her and she took the book with her and they said we've got no idea what our mum would want she's She's had a stroke. She's got Alzheimer's. We, she hasn't communicated for years. And so Di was able to look in this book and say, do you know what? In 1994, she said she wants this, this and this. And it, it was a dream. It was so lovely. And, we, and everyone had this book. So have a not yet dead book. Get people to fill out their wishes. Keep the copies in your church. Um, get people to talk, as Leah has said, do grave talk, do death cafes. Um, it just, it does make a difference. And do it when it's funny. You know, I talk about what I would spend the lot, my lottery winnings on every week. Um, and I, and I've never won the lottery. So if I talk about my death wishes every week, I'm never gonna die. And people seem to think as soon as you put, you start speaking about death, you're gonna die. And that's not true. So make it fun. Talk about it when, you know, when someone famous dies, then it's a good. It, it opens a conversation, um, and especially in lockdown, the things that we can't do anymore make us really treasure the things that we can do. So this is a time to really ask your families, your communities, your congregation, what is precious? What things do you? would make it different for you um, and write those down. It, it's, a, it's a good conversation. Have, have dinner, well, on Zoom maybe, be good. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, Juliet. We are drawing uh, to a close with the time. It is now quarter to six already. Can you believe? I just wanted to, just to give the opportunity only if they want to, to Lee or Leah to say any f final thought or comment. Um, They've been absolutely brilliant giving up their afternoon today. I'm so grateful. But uh, I, th I think you, you've been really wonderful. Thank you, Juliet, too, for, for being with us and for um, opening up this subject so richly. And uh, we could go on uh, all evening with the wisdom in the room. And thank you to those who have contributed as well with their, with their own stories. This, of course, is not the last of the sessions. Um, we have one more to go next week, and we are looking very specifically at 
think death and money again back to this issue of money thinking practically about legacies in a pandemic and we have a really impressive panel um, of Dr Claire Rootley who has written a whole PhD on on um, why people give money uh, to their church uh, well uh, legacies and, and and church life um she's worked in fundraising for 15 years we have Stuart Graham who um, is a director of fundraising and very interested in the spirituality of fundraising. Um, Ruth Tormey, who works for World Vision and has worked at Christian Aid for many, many years um, in the area of legacies. And we have um, Reverend Canon David Richards um, from Edinburgh, Episcopal Church in Edinburgh, who also um, has wisdom to share on this matter. So do join us for the final session in this Let's Talk About Death and Living Well with Grief series. And thank you ever so much for um, joining us today for the first time or joining us each week. It's been a really rich time of sharing. And uh, this recording, all being well, when my colleague is back, when one colleague is off sick at the moment, but when he is back, this recording will be available again on the Facebook page, as will last week's session once it's um, uploaded. So you can listen again at your own leisure. And do, uh, do contact us if you have any further thoughts on future workshops um, to take this matter forward. But again, Lee, Leah and Juliet, we are really, really grateful for your time today and your wisdom. Thank you. <laughs>